Good evening, friends. My name is Risha Mandelkorn, and on behalf of Aurora Public Library, I have the pleasure of welcoming you to this evening's One Book, One Aurora featured event. Amnesty International is a global movement of committed volunteers who work to end abuses of human rights. Amnesty also supports a monthly book club of which Aurora Public Library is a member. This year's One Book, One Aurora selection, Scarborough by Catherine Hernandez, was the featured title of the Amnesty Book Club. The author is a vocal activist for the LGBTQ plus communities and speaks widely for those marginalized by poverty, intolerance, and racism. And when we thought about who we might collaborate with to flesh out the threads of our annual community read, we knew right away that we wanted to work with our longtime partner, Amnesty, the Aurora New Market Group. Before we begin our panel discussion, I'd like to introduce Lucy Frechette, who's gonna go over the Q&A section um, after the panelists speak. So Lucy, over to you, please. Thank you, Risha. Hi, everyone. So it looks like we have a good group here tonight. Um, I just wanted to, uh, before we get started, point out a few of our Zoom features. So just, uh, just to let everyone know, you don't have to worry about making noise because I have all of you muted out there in the audience. Um, as far as the Q&A, we will be using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So if you just scroll to the bottom and hover over the bottom of your screen, you'll see um, a Q&A box. You can type in your question there and I encourage you to also, if you can, type in the name of the panelist that you would like to address the question to. And uh, if, if you don't have to, because if you don't have um, you know, a preference of who answers it, we'll just, um, we'll share it out to the entire panelists and they could uh, contribute what they, if they want at that point. So anyway, I encourage you to participate um, with those features. Thank you, Lucy. So our facilitator this evening is Jason Clark. Jason is a scientist by training and has traveled extensively mm -hmm. for his work. Travel brought Jason many amazing experiences, but also forced him to see poverty, corruption, and injustice. Ironically, through this lens, he also saw that his own country and even his community has darkness beneath the surface that is present, but often ignored. About three years ago, Jason happened upon a meeting of the local Amnesty Aurora New Market Group and learned that we can make change happen by acting with others who share a vision of a world where everyone lives in dignity. Welcome everybody to Taking Action on Human Rights. And Jason, over to you. Thank you, Risha, and hello everybody. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. Why? Because the library asked me? No. Because Amnesty International asked me? No. Because when I was growing up, I never learned the traditional names of the lands around me. When I went to school, Indigenous people were talked about in the past tense. Their vibrant cultures dismissed, their stewardship of the land ignored, their current struggles didn't seem to exist. But I looked at the Statistics Canada Census and in 2016, Aboriginal, which is a catchphrase for First Nations, Mete, uh, Inuit, was nearly 2 million people. So clearly not past tense. This group has gained some voice through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. But to have reconciliation, I believe that we need to begin by, by educating ourselves. Uh, I certainly didn't learn about this in my school and in, in my background. I urge all of you to look at a website called native-land.ca. That's native-land.ca. It tells you the indigenous peoples for anywhere you are in Canada. So if I look at that today, I would have to acknowledge for where I'm calling from now, the Haudenosaunee, the Ashinabawaki, and the Mississauga people. So unless I had looked, I would have no idea. Now I can begin to go on a journey to explore those cultures and to learn about that. The second thing I would like to do is create a safe space here for everybody to have a really good, respectful dialogue. So I welcome everybody here today. It doesn't matter what your race is, your religion, your culture, gender, gender identity, age, ability, disability, political views. Did I miss you? If I missed you, well, guess what? You're welcome too. Everybody is welcome today. So now we're finished with that stuff. We can move on with the program, right? Well, except that all of that is very much to do with our program today. 
because our topic today is about is about human rights and how everybody can take action on human rights. This is a really, really big topic. And to kind of begin the journey of exploring this topic, I'd like to begin with a short video. But I have a couple of disclaimers. The first one is that this video is about a particular injustice in a particular country. And I don't want to single out any particular country or government because injustices happen all over the world. And the second thing is a video, it's not graphic, but it does cover difficult topics as does the panel today. So I just want you to be aware of that. And with that being said, I will now ask Lucy, our Zoom host, to please run the video. All of a sudden I found myself I was surrounded by five huge guys and they asked me that if I'm Hamid Semi, and I confirmed that, that I am and they said we have a few questions for you. They gave me a blindfold to put it on my eyes, they handcuffed me and they took me inside the building. The, the, the whole thing is just a sham. It, nothing is true in, in, the, in this case. There's no confession, no doc, no evidence whatsoever. I was psychologically tortured, physically tortured, and uh, I never confessed it to anything because uh, I didn't know what's going on. Explain for somebody to understand when you're wrongfully accused and you've been sentenced to death, how it feels. Only that person can know how it really feels. I felt that I never gonna get out of there. The Amnesty International Iran Circle took a very close interest to Hamid and they started to want to really make actions and which helped us to make it into an international case. But the start was from Amnesty International, from here, with Antonella. She started it. She started a campaign, she expanded into Amnesty International. They came down to their knees, as far as I'm concerned. finished now. I'm home. She did it. They all did it. They all did it for me. You know, there's a lot of um, goodness uh, that we take for granted and we don't realize how much goodwill it takes. And you know, we gotta find a way to thank these people. This could be a start. Amnesty International supporters, with your support, I've been reunited with my family. With your support, I don't have the nightmare of execution anymore. And with your support, you got me my freedom back. And I want to thank you. Thank you, Lucy, for playing the video. I didn't pick this video at random. I picked this video because it has a connection to our community. Your local Amnesty International chapter was involved. In Hamid's wife, they campaigned along with the rest of Amnesty for his release. And Hamid came and personally thanked that team once he came back to Canada. I've invited three members from the local Amnesty chapter to be with us today, to be on the panel. First, let me introduce Len Bulmer. Len is deeply involved in the community. He founded with his wife, Renee, this local chapter. He's also involved in Toastmasters International. He's a longtime volunteer at the ER in South Lake and has done nursing home visitations for a long time. He's also doing research and analysis for an advocacy group that's pushing for improvements in long-term care in Ontario. So welcome, Len. Also, we have Heather Cooper, 
Heather joined the group when it began, and she helps to organize events, update the group members about meetings and special events, and gather news from Amnesty International, Canada, and GTA to bring to us. Welcome to Heather. We also have Linda Alderson. She lives in Richmond Hill and has been with Amnesty for over three years. She updates and manages our group website, which is amnestyaurora.wordpress.com. So Amnesty Aurora is one word, amnestyaurora.wordpress.com. She also organizes our presence at the farmer's market and other events. Welcome, Linda. We're also fortunate today to be joined by Karen Castillo. Karen is a major gifts and monthly giving associate at AI Canada since 2019. And before that, she worked for the regional office in Mexico for the human rights education team and youth and activism team. Karen grew up in Mexico, is deeply passionate about advancing women's rights and supporting indigenous land defenders in that region. She also loves supporting Amnesty events groups and last year part of the, the national youth organizers here in Canada. So welcome Karen, welcome to our panelists. Let's begin the discussion. You've seen on the tagline on the poster inviting you to today's session that Amnesty International is this huge international movement, millions of people over 150 countries who campaign to end human rights abuses. Karen, can you give us some idea about how AI is structured and how this happens? Yes, of course. And thank you, everyone. Thank you to the Aurora New Market Group for inviting me today. And thank you for everyone who's here today. Um, so when we talk about how Amnesty International is structured and what, what we work on, it's a really like broad question because like, as, as you mentioned, we have uh, representation in over 150 countries and we work on a wide variety of issues, themes and areas. Uh, but for somebody that might just be starting or getting to know Amnesty, I really want to emphasize that our, our work is heavily centered on research incredible, reliable, and amazing research on different human rights issues. And this research is the basis of all of our, our other work, like activism, campaigning, and advocacy work. Um, the reports that we produce uh, really allow us to know what's happening around the world, what human rights are being violated, and how we can fix the problems we identify. Uh, so for example, it's very interesting to see Hamid's case because it might be an individual case, right? Um, but Amnesty has produced very wide and well-known reports about um, human rights violations in, in Iran or Iran, <laughs> however you pronounce it. Um, so yeah, so those reports and, and really getting sense of the big picture really allow us to work on specific cases and really allow us to do that like very specific advocacy work with governments and, and basically having all that research and support from facts uh, from statistics and and from all that we produce from those from from that research, um, so we usually after we have a report, uh, we design campaigns to ask the public to defend the rights of people who are being threatened or attacked. Uh, another report that you mentioned, Jason, was the missing and murdered Indigenous women, which was also report produced by Amnesty Canada, and which allow us to develop um, campaigns um, during several years asking to stop the violence against indigenous women here in, in this country. Uh, so yeah, so besides designing campaigns, we also have a lot of advocacy work with governments where we basically ask uh, different uh, levels of government to either um, stop threatening or, or attacking a specific group or to pass uh, specific laws to support and defend human rights uh, or to basically defend a community. So that's a little bit of the work <laughs> we do, uh, just trying to really be brief and sort of summarizing it. And when we talk about the uh, amnesty structure, um, it's also a little bit complex. Uh, so when we talk about the representation in countries, uh, we call offices like Amnesty International Canada sections. And some sections are bigger, older, and have large, larger fundraising programs than other. For example, Amnesty International Canada is considered uh, a quite large um, section uh, in the movement compared to, for example, Amnesty International Puerto Rico or Amnesty International Paraguay that are sections that are just like starting and that they're like, like, like have like just like a, a smaller capacity. Uh, so, so it, Karen, if I can jump in there, that's yeah. a great overview. How I'm just curious how this goes from so you have these issues and we have these offices 
But I'm wondering for Lun, how did this end up becoming a group that you helped to start here in York region? Do we need a group like this in York region? How does that work? Uh, well, th thank you very much, Jason. We sure do need a group like this in New York region. Uh, it was about 15 years ago, it was in 2005, that uh, my wife, Renee, and I looked around the landscape of New York region and said, why don't we have a group here? We had lived, this is the seventh province we've lived in. This is the first place we ever lived in that didn't have an amnesty group. Uh, you look at York region, we've got a population in excess of a million people. And, and I think this is probably the largest municipality, York Region being the municipality in Canada that didn't have an amnesty group and still now only still has the one. Uh, and when you look at York Region, the reasons that 15 years ago, uh, Jason and, and everyone else who's listening, the reasons from 15 years ago are still there and are still even perhaps even more important now. Uh, you look at York Region, you know, we have one of the richest and best educated populations in Canada. We have political clout within the Canadian political system. Our MPs are listened to in Ottawa. And I think it's really important that we have a group here because we can inform that political level and have them in turn inform our government in the areas of human rights, both domestically and globally. And, and here in York region, but we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a country that contains the majority of the world's headquarters for resource extraction. And many of those companies have been involved in human rights abuses around the world for many years. And some of those have been headquartered in York region. One of them was headquartered about a kilometer down the street here from me a few years ago. And one of the things too, when you're involved in human rights, you start learning that environmental degradation is increasingly intersecting with human rights abuses. And I don't think a lot of us think about this here in York region, but we are one of the biggest major population centers that exports all, all of its solid and liquid waste outside of its borders. We have this real mentality when we live here that what's out of sight is out of mind. And even all of us, and, and, and you know, I include myself in this too, we're consumers and as consumers, we are the end participants in a global supply chain often, the global supply chains that exploit vulnerable populations in other parts of the world. And I think that another important point is you raised it as well, Jason, is that the beginning. We live on land that was occupied for thousands of years before we got here by peoples who unfortunately often live in third world conditions throughout Canada. And I think the last reason that it's important to me anyway, that we have a York region amnesty group is York region is at the crossroads of the world. We have one of the most diverse <laughs> populations in the world right here in York region. Many, many people who live in York region were born outside of Canada and they know and they understand what human rights abuses look like up close. And I know when you talked to me about this at the beginning, Jason, you know, when you, well, we were putting this together, you asked the same question that you did just a few moments ago. Did we need an amnesty group in York region 15 years ago? Yes. Do we need one now? Yes, and my answer is even more so. Thanks thank a lot. Thank, thank you. you, Len. That's a great picture. I'm gonna move on with some more questions, but while I do that, I encourage the audience to enter questions into the question and answer box for questions that you have for this group and, and the panel. So I'd like to move on to happened at Amnesty International Group. There's certainly awareness campaigns and events like today. There's a big focus on letter writing. I'm going to ask Heather to weigh in on this. What's with all the letter writing? There's an annual Write for Rights event. Can you please uh, talk about letter writing? Sure. Um, yeah, as a person watching who wasn't familiar with Amnesty might wonder, well, I, I really would like to make a difference, but I, I don't know how do I go about writing letters? 
Well, writing letters is basically the backbone of amnesty, uh, particularly back when it started in 1961, but it's still very much current today. And um, for example, um, we're given, um, or not given, we, we ask for um, three what's called urgent actions every month sent to our group here in Aurora Newmarket. And um, the reason they're urgent is somebody may be on death row, perhaps their case is coming up or they've just disappeared or so something that really needs an immediate response. So we ask for a selection of three. And um, for anybody who's new to letter writing, there are uh, really simple and straightforward guidelines and uh, group members can help as well, but get you started. And each case, uh, as Karen mentioned, has been carefully researched. And I personally have complete confidence knowing that Amnesty has vouched for these as worthwhile cases. And um, it, each uh, case will give you a background summary of what, what the problem is um, and exactly who to address your letter to and maybe four or five bullet points that you can choose to um, elaborate on. We use a respectful tone. We don't rant and rave. We don't express any political views per se. Amnesty takes a neutral view based on the International uh, Declaration of Human Rights. We don't you know, support one political or religious or system of government. We strictly adhere to abuse of human rights. Anyway, and uh, just to bring it up to date, we also, in some cases, uh, email or Twitter even, or whatever is, if time is of the essence. Uh, usually we're writing to government uh, officials that are in charge of these people, uh, their situation. Um, maybe I'll just take a second then to, to move on to uh, what was mentioned, the write-a-thon, or it's known as Right for Rights. It takes place every year, December 10th or around that date, and that is the date that this International Declaration of Human Rights was adopted by the UN in 1948. So it's, it's pretty impressive because uh, uh, it's, it's all virtual this year, as you can imagine, but there's going to be 10 particular cases are selected. There is a uh, website writeathon.ca you can look at if you're interested and you could participate from your own home. You don't have to go anywhere or, and it would, uh, it's really an interesting selection. Last year they had all youth um, activists and I'm not sure what the theme, if anything, is this year. And I think they had something like three million letters were written around the world. So it, it really gives you a feeling of camaraderie and that other people around the world and are, are trying to make a difference. Thank you, Heather. One question that I've heard many people ask and I was very curious about is, does letter writing work? There's all these letters, what happens when these letters are sent out? Is this a, a productive thing to do? And to weigh in on this, I'm going to ask Linda to join the conversation. Hi, thanks, Jason, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for giving up your time this evening to listen to us. So does letter writing really work? And the short answer is yes. The longer answer is if we look at the 10 Right for Rights cases of December 2019, which focused on youth, uh, there's been positive movement in seven of the 10 cases. I think that's a pretty good, 70% is, is a pretty good number. And positive movement takes various forms. For the people of First Nation community of Grassy Narrows, it means the signing of a formal agreement for a $19.5 million care facility to be finally built in their community to, um, to help them with the, the effects of mercury poisoning that they've been suffering for a number of years now. For Yasmin Arani, who was one of the 10 cases last year of Iran, it means that her original sentence of 16.4 years has been reduced to five as work continues to procure her release. For Magai Nagan of South Sudan, who was only 15 when he was sentenced to death, he's had his death sentence revoked. And of course, letter writing played a huge part in the release of Hamid, um, as we saw in the video that began, began this session. 
Not all positive outcomes are reduction in or complete revocation of the original sentencing. Sometimes the result is access to family visits, proper legal representation, and appropriate medical attention. A byproduct of letter writing is also seen in the mental health of not just the specific individual, but also their family and community. To know that they're not alone in the nightmare brings great comfort. So in many of these cases, Amnesty has received acknowledgement from the government officials and or the, the organization involved. Most countries, not all, unfortunately, but most do care about how they're viewed on the world stage. So these campaigns of Amnesty International that focus attention on blatant human rights violations are peaceful means of jostling these countries towards a more just and humane legal framework. Okay, thank you, Linda. Some people like to get involved in events like today or tabling. Some people like to get involved in letter writing. Some people prefer to make donations. One question I think our viewers might be interested in is what happens with donation donations? To weigh in on that, I'm going to ask Heather and then maybe Karen if she wants to add as well. Okay, I'll speak to the local part um, as a small group here in Aurora Newmarket. Um, we don't get money from anybody. Uh, we, we raise a little money by selling uh, handmade cards and bookmarks and things. And the main cost we have is postage. When we've held a write-a-thon event in December each year, um, we like to encourage people to come out and then we'll say, you know, just put your letters here in a basket and we mail them. But as you can imagine, um, many of them going overseas. So that's pretty much we do small scale uh, fundraising just for postage. Now, um, there are larger groups elsewhere that, that have lots of innovative, larger scale um, events. I can't name an example personally, but, but I know that happens in international dinners, you know, things like that. And then um, I just, I'll turn this over to Karen in a second, but I'd like to mention that you can, for example, to support Amnesty as a whole, be a monthly donor, like I happen to be a monthly donor. You can just have, just like anything else, you know, X dollars a month goes to Amnesty and you get newsletters and so on. Uh, that's one option. And um, as far as what it's used for, and Karen, maybe you're, you're more um, experienced in that. Maybe you could take over from me. Thanks. Yes, and I don't want to like um, extend a lot, but like I mentioned, like our, our fundraising and donations are used to basically support our work worldwide. I mean, Amnesty International Canada has its own fundraising program. So what we fundraise um, goes to work on programs, on activism, on campaigning here in Canada. But we also um, send or, or give part of, of our fundraising um, total revenue or money or however you want to call it to the international movement. So it really goes to international campaigns that are focused on defending refugees and and basically all the global work, uh, which includes like um, legal legal counseling or, or legal defense for prisoners of conscience. So it really goes to a wide variety of issues. Um, and something that I also wanted to mention is that um, there's many, I mean, Amnesty International Canada does not accept any type of funding from governments, um, corporations, um, or political parties. So that really allows us to like speak out and to really like pressure governments with all the uh, freedom of being independent and not being constrained by, by those political views or, or other type of views. So that's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> Great, thank you, Heather and Karen for uh, bringing some light onto that topic. Next, I'd like to talk about the, the scope of amnesty. A question that some of our viewers might be interested in is how does amnesty decide if something is unfair? What what sort of guideposts do they use for that? How do they define human rights? We have a big topic, but for a high level short explanation, I'm gonna ask Linda. Um, so it is a, um, that is a, a huge question. Amnesty has been in action since 1961. To, to end human rights violations and support justice and, and dignity for all. 
and referring to human rights in the context of their work, they, uh, they use the Universal Declaration of Human Rights document that was developed and adopted, as I think we've heard earlier this evening, by the United Nations back in 1948. And this document acts like a, a global roadmap for freedom and equality. The document is very clear that it is the right of every individual to live their lives freely, equally, and with dignity. Um, the declaration itself does outline 30 rights and freedoms that belong to all of us and that no one should have the ability to take away from us. An example of these rights and freedoms are the right to be free from torture, uh, the right to freedom of expression, the right to education, like, like, you know, really basic things that so many of us here in York region um, who have grown up in Canada just, you know, take for granted, uh, the right to seek asylum. Uh, the list also includes social and cultural rights, such as the rights to social security, health, adequate housing, and rights to life, liberty, liberty, and, and privacy, which is a huge issue these days, are all covered in, in this document. So amnesty does not support any particular political, religious, or ideological system. It's, it aims to remain impartial and neutral. And today, operating in around 150 countries, Amnesty turns knowledge of human rights violations into global awareness and action. And it's the careful research that we've already spoken about tonight that's done to uncover the truth about the human rights abuses and helps to mobilize individuals, just like you, know, you and me, uh, to take action so that these human rights abuses are stopped and individuals and communities are protected and that the perpetrators of human rights violations are brought to justice. Thank you, Linda. Now we've talked about amnesty, we've talked about human rights and Risha has introduced a book, the One Book, One Aurora book, Scarborough for this year. And I understand it's all tied together somehow. And to explain how that works, I'm gonna ask Karen who I understand has read the book and has something to share there. Please go ahead, Karen. Yes, and I love that book. I, I need to say that it really became one of my favorite ones. And, and yeah, like um, Amnesty, International, Amnesty International has its own reading book, uh, which is all virtual most of the time, uh, although some groups meet uh, face to face. And yeah, one of these books was um, Scarborough. And, and the reason why I really love this book, it's because I think it explains the connection of profound and deep systems of injustice um, that are rooted in our political system and that we sometimes don't see or don't analyze, but which translate into human rights violations in lack of opportunities for people and in discrimination and racism. Um, and the way that I connect this book and what it talks about uh, and the way I relate it to the work of Amnesty International is because very often I get comments as a staff person <laughs> from donors, activists, and people or people in social media that do not understand why we work on, for example, cultural and economic rights, or why we talk about racism, gender inequality, and discrimination. And sometimes they argue that our value is in only protecting prisoners of conscience or making our work very focused on law or government advocacy. But what we really need to understand is that unless we solve the roots of the problems, uh, we will continue to have human rights violations. We will continue to have prison prisoners of conscience, political killings, we'll continue to have refugees and land defenders killed. Uh, so that's what I love about the book, uh, that it narrates so beautifully and painfully at the same time how rooted human rights violations are in our system and how important it is for all of us to work at, at the depth of that level. Thank you, Karen. I have more questions for our panelists, but I'd like to get some questions from the audience. We do have a first question from the audience here, which is, how can we educate ourselves more about human rights abuses and issues? Someone's interested in taking action, but sometimes feels like they don't know enough to be outspoken about them. So how can we be confident in the information that we're getting and then speak out? 
And for that, I'm thinking maybe Heather is a good person to answer because she's involved in our urgent actions and how we write our letters. Well, um, I, I guess just speaking personally, I I do um, have confidence in the research as, as I guess you're saying, we, we can't all of us be everywhere at all the time. There is a point that we have to take things on faith. And I think Amnesty has a, a excellent reputation in all these years. so. I personally am comfortable with, um, let's say you're not in a group, but you go to the website amnesty.ca. There's unfortunately a constant list of um, opportunities to, to write letters around the world. Um, and I feel confident that if they have researched it, that it's a bona fide case, they sift through literally hundreds of applicants, if you will, and um, you know, consider many factors, which it won't take me too long to go into as to which they um, proceed with. And if you wanted to write letters from home, for example, you can even ask to be on the urgent action list and be emailed one, say, every month, or you want only ones from certain countries or only ones to do with environmental issues, et cetera, and these could be emailed to you uh, whenever you want. So my, I guess my answer to having the confidence is I would read the frequently asked questions section on the Amnesty site as well. It uh, seemed to give a lot of background that I thought um, hopefully would answer a little bit of your, of your question. Thank you, Heather. So we're waiting for some more questions from the audience. If you have a question, please type it into the box at the bottom, the Q&A box, so that we can address it. In the meantime, I have another question. I think people would be curious, what happens at a meeting when the local group gets together? Uh, how often do they meet? How do they meet now that uh, we're going to usually a virtual environment and so on? What do they discuss? Maybe to weigh in on that, I'll ask Len. Well, I think I'm going to defer that question over to somebody like Linda, actually, because it's been a while. So I haven't been to a meeting for a while during in Zoom lane. So Tell, tell us what it looks like to look at the Hollywood Square scenario. <laughs> so um, we do meet once a month. We did used to meet in person once a month between, and Heather, you can correct me, September, October, November, and then January to May. Yes, we had our special uh, write-a-thon event in December. That's in December we have, and so we consider that our meeting. And a general meeting, really, we talk about if there's an event coming up that we need to coordinate ourselves and get organized. Um, and other than that, we, we spend it, um, perhaps there is some information that's come up from the Toronto office that Renee has brought about a recent case that, uh, that good news has arrived. Um, other than that, we focus on writing a couple of the letters from the three urgent actions that that are brought are brought to to the meeting. We tend to uh, handwrite them. Uh, we do have some members that prefer to go home and type. Apparently, handwriting is is still considered a really good means of communicating with with people. They consider. Um, the, the fact that someone actually took time to hand write a letter uh, adds weight to, um, to, you know, to, the, to the support. So, um, so that's, basically, that's basically all we're doing. Now that we're having Zoom meetings, Heather does send out an email about a week before, um, and what is it, the third, is it the third Thursday of the month, Heather? I think it's the second. I was wondering the if you could mention the, the blog. You know, I don't, you know, I just wait for Heather's email and, and <laughs> um, now she has been, Jason has been helping us with the Zoom. And, and uh, so there'll be a Zoom link, link on that. And we have been uh, doing our meetings by Zoom. I am posting the urgent actions on our website, right. which again is auroranewmarket.wordpress. Dot com and uh, they get they get put up the Wednesday or Thursday of, of the Thursday night meeting so you you can certainly go in there and and choose one or two or three urgent actions 
And there's so, a contact us too. I was just going to say on the blog, right? If you had questions. Yes. Well, let me jump in there, Heather, because we have a question here saying if we want to join the local amnesty chapter, how do we do that? Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure what we, <laughs> we, we have a information number and an email on our website, which is um, amnestyaurora.wordpress.com that you can uh, contact, phone, email, whatever. Yes, so, so as far as joining our group, if you, uh, you, like Heather says, there's contact information, there's a contact page. So you can either email or phone. If you phone, you'll get Renee. Um, yeah. And uh, you can certainly go on our mailing list and you will get notification of any of the upcoming events that we're participating in, such as tonight's event, and you'll get notification of the uh, urgent actions going up on the website and, and anything else that's, that's happening. Perfect, yeah. thank you. I'd like to jump in with uh, one other question here, and this might be our last question looking at our time, depending on how much uh, audience interest there is in extending the session. What about youth? How do youth get involved? If there's a, a teenager, for example, what age do you define youth? Tell us about youth activism in Canada. I think Karen would be a great person to weigh in on that. Yes, um, I mean, there's many opportunities for youth people. So one would be your local group, of course, if, 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 if there's a community uh, or a group in, in your community, but we also have opportunities at the national level so for example, we have this program called National Youth Organizers, which is uh, I think from ages like 15 to like 20, 25. And basically you form part of this like youth group across the, across the country and you are supposed to organize events. They can be online in your community, in your university, uh, and basically just organize events um, that support Amnesty's work. Uh, we also have the uh, National Youth Advisory, Advisory Committee, ENIAC called, that also supports all of our work and, and it's a consultation group that basically engages and brings the youth vision to, to our work and, and decision making. So those, be, those would be like two, two really good places to start and, and you can find more about them in the Amnesty website, so amnestyinternationalcanada.ca, sorry. <laughs> I think, yes, sorry, I, I got a little bit confused. So yeah, it's, uh, I can send it on the chat um, afterwards where, where you can check it. No problem. It's, there's two websites to look for. One is Amnesty Aurora, that's one word, .wordpress.com for the local group. And amnesty.ca will also get you a lot of information as well. I think at this point, we're going to wrap up. I'd like to thank all of our panelists for coming out today. Big round of applause for all of you. Probably you can't hear the audience because they're on mute, <laughs> but a big round of applause for, for them. And I'd like to thank the audience for taking your time to come out here as well. Please check out the website, send us any questions that you have. We'll be happy to, to answer them. And I'd also like to thank the Aurora Public Library for the partnership. And with that, I'm gonna hand control back to Risha. Oh, I don't want control, Jason. I just want to participate with this fabulous, energized uh, group of people. Um, I want to thank everybody, Jason and, and Amnesty, for putting this together. I want to thank our guests for coming out this evening. Um, it's such an important call to action and to see how many people, because I can see the numbers, have engaged in this conversation. Um, it makes me feel just really, really good about the world we're living in and about people wanting to make a difference. So I, I really do thank you on a, a personal as well as an organizational level. If you're interested in learning more about Amnesty, the Aurora New Market Group, again, visit amnestyaurora.wordpress.com. To keep up with programs and events at Aurora Public Library, I hope you'll check us out at aurorapl.ca. This evening's event is part of the One Book, One Aurora Community Initiative for 2020. And for more on the annual Aurora, um, One Book, One Aurora Community Read, please visit onebookoneaurora.com. So from APL, out to you. Enjoy the rest of your evening and please stay safe. 
After World War II, the countries of the world got together and said, we can't let this happen again. In that war, over 50 million people lost their lives. The word genocide was introduced to our language. So the countries of the world gathered and they created the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. They said these are the human rights that all human beings have because they are human. Amnesty's role is to make sure that those human rights are enjoyed by everyone, everywhere. Amnesty does this in three ways. Firstly, we research human rights abuses. Secondly, we bring the evidence of those abuses to those who are in power and who are able to make the change that is needed to stop them occurring. And thirdly, we mobilise millions of people around the world to pressure those decision makers to make them stop those human rights abuses. One of the things that makes Amnesty unique is that for 50 years it's been a grassroots movement. It started with groups of people in small communities getting together to put pressure on governments that locked up people for their political beliefs. Many people in our world are suffering with many kind of torture by their states or uh, by their law enforcement agency or force. Grassroots has always been central to what Amnesty does. It's a worldwide movement of millions of people with hundreds of thousands here in Australia who get together and work in their communities to protect their own human rights and the human rights of people around them and the human rights of people around the world. Amnesty campaigns on many different human rights abuses. Amnesty's campaigns can start from a member of the public walking into one of our action centres anywhere in the world and telling us about someone who's been abducted, someone who's at threat. We research, we make sure we know what's happening, and then we campaign if we find that human rights abuses are occurring. But our campaigns can also come from long-term strategic thinking. What can we change about the world to make it safer for people? And it's those sort of campaigns, the things like a convention against torture and a global arms trade treaty that potentially save the lives of millions of people. So whether it's the rights of an individual or the rights of millions, Amnesty is committed to change, no matter how long it takes.